I want to welcome you to our hearing. Is it Connaughton or Connaughton? Thank you. It's Connaughton. I appreciate that, Mr. Connaughton. Chairman. Connaughton. I apologize to you it's, for it's mispronouncing the Irish, it. So. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. We uh, welcome you to our hearing today. Your prepared statement will be in the record in its entirety. We'd like to ask if you would to uh, try to limit your oral presentation to um, around five minutes. Uh, we'll have some leniency on that. Uh, it's the policy of this committee to swear in all witnesses. I'd like to ask you to rise and hold up your right hand. You uh, promise to tell us the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. The uh, record will indicate that the witness answered in the affirmative, Mr. Connaughton. Connaughton? Connaughton. Connaughton. <laughs> Thank you. Forgive me. You can call me Waxman or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Uh, please go ahead with your oral presentation. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back before you yet again after many appearances. Um, I would note that Dac Dr. Jack Marburger, the President's Science Advisor, was also interested uh, in being part of this discussion uh, as he is the senior scientist overseeing uh, federal government uh, policy. Um, and I'm sure that he'd be look forward to working with the committee as we go forward as you, as you continue this inquiry. Uh, over the last six years, this administration has relied on the advice of scientists from 13 government agencies, from the National Academies of Science, and in developing our 10-year strategic plan that you heard about today, from scientists from 36 countries. Now, all of this is in an effort to guide federal climate change science, technology research, and policymaking. Uh, as you heard earlier, of particular importance to this hearing is, in fact, the 2001 National Academy of Sciences report on climate science commissioned by President Bush. That report set the foundation for what we knew about the climate science at that time and what we still needed to know. The questions before this committee are not new, including those involving CEQ's role in reviewing documents. With respect to the 2003 Climate Change Science Program's 10-year strategic plan, which I'm showing you here, it's about 200 pages long, Dr. James Mahoney, who's a PhD scientist and a top official overseeing that program, informed the Congress several times years ago that he was responsible, ultimately, for the final content of this report. To the best of Dr. Mahoney's knowledge, quote, no errors were contained in the two reports, end quote. Dr. Mahoney further affirmed that edits proposed, uh, affirmed that, quote, edits proposed by CEQ did not misstate any specific scientific fact, end quote. Following that, the National Academies of Sciences wrote that the plan, quote, articulates a guiding vision is appropriately ambitious and is broad in its scope. Now, with respect to the 2003 climate budget summary also discussed today, and that's called our changing planet, that's about 120 pages, most of the edits recommended by CEQ were actually accepted or changed somewhat by the science program officials responsible for the document. Only three were not, and CEQ would have no objection to the fact that they were included. Now, as to the early two-page draft on climate in the 2003 draft report on the environment. This one's more than 600 pages long. I don't have the technical appendices here. The relative few agency comments of interest to some on this committee were actually of no import because the EPA administrator decided to replace the passage with a reference directing the public to the two much more substantial reports above that came out at the same time. That's these two reports. These are huge, hundreds of pages with the entire scientific community in consensus on the content of these reports. Now, in any event, in my written, as detailed in my written testimony, when you look at the actual comments being proposed by the various offices, not just CEQs, most of them either echoed nearly verbatim or appropriately reflected the substance of the 2001 National Academies of Science report on climate science. Now, this is a fact that even a cursory direct comparison or even a Google search would have revealed. And I did it. I Googled one of the edits just to see what turned up. And the expression the edit recommended shows up in numerous science documents, including in the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, finally, the committee's focus on my former chief of staff, Mr. Philip Cooney, who you saw here today, is misguided. And actually, I find it a little bit ironic. It was Mr. Cooney who was responsible for inviting J Dr. James Hansen to the White House in 2003 to brief me and other senior officials on advances in climate change science. It was a remarkable and important presentation. It was Mr. Cooney who was the driving force behind working to ensure that federal government documents and our budgets were actually responsive to the priority research areas 
that Dr. Hansen himself identified along with his colleagues at the National Academy of Sciences. Now, it was also Mr. Cooney who, precisely because he's an expert in the energy sector, who zeroed in on Dr. Hansen's very useful policy recommendation about the substantial climate change benefits of aggressively tackling methane emissions and black soot now, something we could do now. And therefore, it's Mr. Cooney who became the driving force in creating this international methane to markets partnership, a 19-nation effort that's going to remove more than 180 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions from the atmosphere by 2015. Now, this is going to come from oil and gas operations, something Mr. Cooney knows something about, mining, something he also knows something about, landfills and agriculture. And then it was Mr. Cooney, in terms of proactive climate policy to actually make a difference, who helped establish the Climate Vision Partnership and who for the first time secured industry emission reduction commitments from 14 major energy intensive industrial sectors, including the Business Roundtable. I just have to say, uh, I, I live in two worlds, the world of the reality and the experience on my job and what I've been hearing a little bit here today. Uh, Mr. Cooney was among the most proactive supporters of both the science enterprise and advancing it, but more importantly, he was one of the most proactive creators of sensible policies built on the science that are actually going to help us cut our emissions. The totality of this administration's record is one of unparalleled funding, openness, and inclusiveness in confronting the serious challenge of global climate change. Uh, I, I think the sum of this is um, I fear that we're sort of losing the forest for the twigs in this discussion. The forest is this massive science enterprise. The forest is the massive technology investments in which the United States is leading the way in tackling global emissions, not just here, but abroad. And I hope that as the committee continues its inquiry, we can begin to lay that information out on the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Connaughton. Um, oh, just one minute. Um, let me go right to this memo. It was a memo written from Mr. Cooney to Kevin O'Donovan in the Vice President's office. We don't have a copy of that memo uh, because it's being withheld from the committee. But we did have a chance to review that memo and it obviously stirred some concern when we had Mr. Yarmouth, uh, when Mr. Yarmouth pursued a question about it. The memo refers to a paper by Soon Balanus, Bellinus that was funded in part by the American Petroleum Institute. The paper purports to show that the past century was not the warmest in the last thousand years. My understanding is that the conclusions of the paper have been heavily criticized by the scientific community. The memo to the Vice President's office says, I quote, we plan to begin to refer to this study in administration communications on the science of global climate change. In fact, CEQ just inserted a reference to it in the final draft chapter on global climate change containing EPA's first State of the Environment report. That's the memo to the Vice President's office from Mr. Cooney. The memo also states that the paper, and I quote, represents an opening to potentially, potentially reinvigorate debate on the actual climate history of the past thousand years, end quote. My concern is that the documents suggest that there was a concerted White House effort to inject uncertainty into the climate change debate. This communication between Mr. Cooney and the Vice President's office seems to reflect exactly this kind of effort. Did CEQ communicate with the Vice President's office about how to inject the soon Balianus report into the federal climate change reports? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I will leave aside the moments, uh, the, the issues related to uh, potential executive privilege, which you're still working on with the committee. I will limit my remarks to commentary on the soon value. Well, no, why report. don't you limit your remarks to my question? Did the CEQ communicate with the Vice President's office about how to inject the, this report into the climate ch uh, changes uh, reports? It um, is my understanding that uh, CEQ did suggest that the report should uh, be referenced in the new draft environment, uh, state of the environment report, uh, because in fact it was a new and major piece of science. Uh, at the same time, Dr. Hansen uh, was also introducing some of his new research uh, that was also of high interest. Uh, at the same time, we were looking at issues related to the difference between surface temperatures 
and ground level temperatures. So at that time, there was a lot of very interesting development in science, and the soon Bell Unis report was a very important one as well. I found it fascinating. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I can't find it conclusive. Uh, but I likened the debate over that report but to the, the memo we're said Mr. About Chairman, I just want to give an example. I likened the no, debate no, over that me, report. No, no, excuse me, Mr. Connaughton. You asked I, I only have report. a little time. So you thought it was really interesting and worthwhile bringing it in. That was your thought as well as, as Mr. Cooney's. Is that right? No, actually, I'm not speaking to the recommendation that be included. I was made aware of this report, and I found it very interesting. Okay. I actually did not have a role at that time in anything having to do with the edits on the document. Uh -huh. And you did later? I did later, yes. Okay, and tell us when, when you did later. What, was it, what were the circumstances? Oh, when the process was not leading to a reconciliation of the comments by the various offices in the White House and from other agencies, um, I did get on the phone. Actually, Governor Whitman called me, EPA Administrator Whitman called me. We were talking about a range of things, but this is one of the issues that we talked about on how to reconcile the, how, how to reconcile the comments. Okay. Now, this memo that was sent to the Vice President's office said this will this will reinvigorate debate about whether the planet is warming. This sounds to me like a play directly out of the Petroleum Institute playbook. Do you have a comment on that? Well, actually, sir, uh, it strikes me as a statement of fact. When that report did come out, it actually did receive, as you indicated, a lot of interest uh, by the scientific community uh, as to the essentials of the solar-based uh, research that was being conducted, in particular by Dr. Balunas, who's actually internationally renowned a solar scientist. But that scientist report has since, since then has been strongly criticized by the scientific community and its conclusions have been rejected. Uh, that actually is, I do not understand that that is, cor that is correct. Okay. You uh, think what I do it, understand that you, there is so a... So it's, is it the position of you and CEQ that that's uh, 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 a fairer statement of what we know about climate change than what uh, Dr. Hansen and others were suggesting? Uh, no, it is not. That is not okay. my position. Uh, what I was going to indicate, Mr. Chairman, the debate that surrounded that report is very similar to the active one undergoing right now about the relative contribution of global warming to hurricane and storm intensity and frequency. Now, this These memo, are very active points of scientific debate, me. and that's part of the variety of viewpoints we're supposed to be incorporating into our process. So this memo um, suggests as well as that there was active coordination between CEQ and the Vice President's Office about how to inject debate and uncertainty into discussions of climate change science. Will you provide this uh, memorandum to our committee? Uh, I think that is something for our lawyers to work out, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are you, uh, unless the White House asserts executive privilege, it should be provided to our committee. Uh, again, that's something I would defer to the counsel for, uh, for the committee and the counsel in the White House. Well, I, I'm requesting... I'm, I'm not in a position to make that, that uh, uh, to take that position personally. I'm requesting that the CEQ turn over uh, that memo and also to provide other communications between CEQ and the Vice President's office. Were there other communications? Uh, I am not aware of other written communications of this type. They could exist. I do not know. And we'll, uh, like, we would like to see the email communications as well. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connerton, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a, a question, and, and, it, and it, it's probably unfair, but it's just an impression, and I want to get it on the record somehow. A number of years ago, before I was in Congress, there was a flack under, uh, uh, under then President Clinton about uh, Speaker Gingrich being forced to go out of the back of Air Force One. And Speaker Gingrich seemed to have a real problem with that. Dr. Hansen is still here. I'm not trying to do this behind his back, but isn't to a certain extent somebody who, who appears 1,400 times uh, in clips, who, uh, who is regularly sort of the toast of the town as a speaker, who's asked to consult uh, to almost anything, including uh, Vice President Gore's uh, movie, isn't, isn't the complaint that you're being muzzled a little bit like Newt Gingrich complaining about going out of the back of Air Force One, a plane that most of us will never see, much less be on? Well, I want to start, as I indicated, of having the highest personal regard and professional regard for Dr. Hanson and his work. My son and I were just watching him on TV last night uh, on, the, on the History Channel. Uh, congressmen, senior administration officials, highly accomplished senior si scientists, we all chafe at having to talk to our public affairs people. But the public affairs people are there for a reason. They're there to organize and be sure that what we are saying is official government policy is understood 
and that the people who might have to then respond to those statements can effectively do so. I mean, this is a process that's been with us for a long, long time, uh, and it works well. Now, we all chafe from it. I can understand Dr. Hansen uh, especially chafing if it comes from someone uh, relatively young and inexperienced, uh, but the policy of public affairs is a very important one. Now, I would note that I am not aware of any instance where any scientist in pursuing their science, of any scientist in seeking peer review, peer review of their science, um, it was in any way uh, 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 controlled, handled, or otherwise managed uh, in their scientific work. I mean, from what I see all over the world, and when people come to me, scientists come and speak their mind. To me, they come and speak their mind to you. Uh, what we're talking about is the science policy interface. And that has significant implications that require some level of management. Well, and, and if I could follow up on that, uh, in the previous panel, I think there was a lot of discussion about certainty versus uncertainty. And certainly, your chief of staff uh, was, was drawn and quartered pretty well for uh, the statement that he was, uh, a statement uh, claiming that he, he was creating uncertainty. Is there any uncertainty about man's influence on the environment at this point from the body of science that you've been part of putting together? In other words, not the nuances, but isn't it, and I'll lead you for a second, isn't it true that this administration has made it very clear that pollutants, whether we call it that or not, including CO2, reflect a clear danger to our environment? Well, I'll put it in the President's words. Uh, the Earth is warming. Humans are part of the problem. We need to get on with the solutions. And I need to stick to layman's terms. I'm not a scientist. And that was clearly reflected in the National right. Academy of Sciences report. So since it's settled science, at least settled presidential policy as stated by the president, that we, are, we do have this problem and we need to be part of the solution. Uh, but this question of settled science, and I'm just going to ask you one question. Isn't it true that it was only this last year uh, that uh, the 2001 uh, understanding of, uh, of, of the rise in, in our oceans has been revised uh, downward, less dramatic than it, was, than it was thought to be? Isn't there always new information coming in that affects one side or the other of speed and, and so on? Well, actually, I think Dr. Hansen was trying to get to this level of complexity in the answer as well, which is the top line. There's a lot of agreement around warming and around the fact that humans play a role. A lot of agreement. But as you then delve down into the science, in the National Academy of Sciences report, um, uh, including the edits recommended by CEQ and others, as well as subsequent documents, the most recent being the IPCC report, which is the international report updating the science, there's a wide range of uncertainties to which we are dedicating nearly $2 billion a year to attempting to resolve. Uh, and so there's still a lot of science to be done. As I indicated in my written testimony, if all the science were settled, we wouldn't be spending $2 billion of taxpayer resources every year on it. This is very important work. One reason for some of the comments is to make sure we are emphasizing the need to go after some of this research, because that's what the National Academy of Science has told us we should do. So I guess I'll, I'll just finish with one one sort of series of questions. There are thousands of scientists that work for the federal government at, at, at all levels. And hundreds, if not thousands of them, worked on the shuttle uh, program over the years. What would have happened if Dr. Hansen's policy that every, senator, every uh, scientist gets to say anything to the camera anytime they want, as long as it's supported by, quote, their science, they, in other words, their, what they do, that they should be able to have an interview anytime, anywhere. What would have happened each time a shuttle went down? Can you, can you just give us a little conjecture of a thousand scientists working at the various launch facilities? What would have happened if, if all of them had, had responded without checking with public affairs, just done their on-camera interviews those days? Well, you'd see the kind of chaos and confusion that this entire discussion is about trying to avoid. So chaos and confusion. So in closing, in public affairs, right? isn't it clear that when you have dozens or hundreds or thousands of scientists, as much as we want to make sure scientists can argue with each other and have that freedom of expression, that First Amendment, so to speak, right, that there has to be some reasonable limitation and has been for decades on how many different scientists can talk at a given time 
and what they can talk about. Yeah, clearly, scientists are free to pursue their research. They're free to publish and talk about their research. The taxpayer funds that all over the world. It's great. It's when we get into expressions of government policy or the science policy interface where you need some level of management. Otherwise, you can fall prey to lots of misinterpretation and misunderstanding about what represents official government policy. I hope all of our scientists all get a ride on Air Force One. Thank you. Yield back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connaughton, I want to ask you about the EPA's <clears throat> draft report on the environment. We've talked about it already today. Uh, the EPA professional staff was deeply concerned about the way the White House handled this report. And if I may, I'd like to, you to refer to Exhibit F, um, which is a memo about the draft report on the environment from the staff of EPA to Administrator Whitman of the EPA. It says that as a result of Mr. Cooney's edits, the text, quote, no longer accurately reflects scientific consensus on climate change. And I read a number of other statements in their examples of what they meant. The EPA memo says that the White House told the EPA that no further changes may be made. Uh, did you make the decision that no further changes would be made? Uh, no, I did not. And I, I would observe, uh, Congressman, that the, um, I only saw this document for the first time over the weekend. Uh, it was not something I saw when, in my conversation lit years ago with Governor Whitman. Um, but I would observe a number of the items being complained of were verbatim language from the National Academy of Sciences report. I mean, that told me something else was going on. There was a pride of authorship going on between, the t between EPA and the other agencies. Um, at the time, by the way, it seemed to me that to the extent there were editorial differences, they should be reconciled. They weren't being reconciled. That suggested some, some back and forth. Um, and that's really what Governor Whitman and I ended up talking about. And the solution that she came up with, I thought, was perfection. So, Well, then, is it not true that someone advised uh, Administrator Whitman that no further changes were to be made? No, actually, or did as she I recall, just... the, the document I saw, again, I only saw it for the first time over the mm -hmm. weekend, was a handwritten note that said, these changes must be made. These changes must be made. But, but I would note the context for that, Congressman, is important. What was happening is e we have a process where agencies provide their input to these documents, and then there's a reconciliation process. It doesn't mean all the comments have to be accepted. You just have to have a process where you say, I accept it, or I reject it, and here's why. That wasn't happening on this particular set of issues. Remember, this document was 600 pages long, as I showed you just a fraction of it. We are talking about a small number of edits to a two-page passage in an otherwise massive document. We we're just down to the end on this. And so it was really what was going on, and I, I thought it was reasonable at the time, was the notion that we needed some reconciliation. It was an issue of whether the comments were in or out. As it happened, by the way, none of the comments being raised by the committee, none of the comments had, could possibly have confused the public because they didn't make it into the report. But that's because EPA found the report to be so inaccurate that it said that if they released it, it would cause great confusion in the public. Isn't that correct? Yep. At least that's what that memo says. I saw the memo. My personal reflections on it seemed a little bit melodramatic. Uh, we have a process for reconciling these kinds of concerns. That wasn't happening, which is how, why it got elevated. I mean, most of what you, we've been talking about here today never even got elevated because Dr. Mahoney, on these science documents, these, mm -hmm. science, you know, these documents that include expressions of science, Dr. Mahoney had a very effective process of reconciling comments. Some of them are included, some are changed, and some of them are excluded. Yeah. And that process wasn't being applied in this particular instance on the draft environment report. And so we worked it out. Well, now, you, you mentioned before that, that so many, all these changes were based on NRC. But in the EPA, again, in this memo, it says that conclusions of the NRC report were deleted. That was one of their complaints, wasn't it? Yeah, well, and that's, again, we can get into lots of back and forth about the particularized edits. I included that in my written testimony. Mm -hmm. um, Others were being asked to be included. Uh, I think one of the things, Congressman, it went to your line of questioning earlier. You have these massive documents, and you have CEQ and other agencies agreeing to 99 percent of them. These have some of the strongest expressions of why we need to take action on climate, the effects of, of, of global warming on, on ecological systems, the research questions on the relation to public health. These documents are full of that, and we didn't have any objection to any of that. Uh, what these comments went to were certain expressions of key uncertainties identified by the Academy that were a qualifier to some absolute, more absolute statements that appeared to be in the text. Now, the National Academy chose to include those qualifications 
it was at least reasonable for reviewers to suggest that some of those qualifications be included as well. Now, ultimately, the scientists decided which ones were appropriate, what tone, what weight to give to those. But, but I do want to underline what was missing in all of the questioning before I came up here was the fact that there was actually massive agreement on you know, more than 99% of these massive documents. That's where all the positive, heavy-duty stuff was on, on climate change. Mm. These qualifiers were a little teeny piece of the discussion. So there's much ado about a very small amount of qualification. Now, thank you. You said that earlier that you did not make the decision that the White House wasn't going to make any changes. But in your conversations with Ms. Whitman, um, did she explain to you why she made the decision not to, uh, that she did, not to make those changes? Oh, as you might expect, this was an executive level conversation. We don't, you know, we weren't into parsing all the back and forth between our various staffs. And I want to ask one uh, of the... You, you, you asked. I mean, mm -hmm. I just want to be clear. Um, I was perfectly content to just get them in a room, especially get the scientists with them, and just reconcile the comments. She had what I thought was a much better solution. And that was, we had just spent over a year developing this document with 1,300 scientists from around the world. Why not refer the public to that rather than try to collapse this down to a two-page passage on climate in a document that otherwise sort of had a rich abundance of detail on a whole bunch of other issues that were not getting the attention they deserved. So, you know, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was a perfect solution. We didn't need to talk a lot. I said, that sounds great to me. Let's just go that way. Okay. My time's expired. Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm actually having a, a hard time trying to figure out what this hearing is uh, all about. I think, Mr. Connaughton, your uh, term of melodramatic probably fits pretty darn well. You've got a 23-year-old young man who was put on the hot seat, and I, I think acquitted himself quite well. Your former chief of staff, uh, or the chief staff of the CEQ, uh, uh, I thought did a remarkable job. I don't think there was a single question left unanswered very directly by him. So I'm not sure why we had him up and were grilling him to, to the degree that we did. And, and then, of course, the third person uh, on the panel is the guy who had the real questions. And uh, those questions come down to uh, uh, what I think evolved as his views as to good and evil. Uh, people in the administration representing uh, something akin to Nazi Germany and people who believe, as he believes, being good. I'd like to read you a quote <clears throat> by Dr. Hansen from 1998. Injection of environmental and political perspectives in midstream of the science discussion cannot help the process of inquiry. I believe that persons with relevant scientific expertise should concentrate with pride on cool, objective analysis, providing information to the public and decision makers when it is found, but leaving the moral implications, this again is the person who raised the issue of the morality of uh, this administration and comparing it to Nazi Germany, leaving the moral implications for later common consideration or at most for summary inferential discussion. <clears throat> I am not implying bias on the part of any particular scientist, but the global warming debate has plentiful examples to illustrate my thesis, especially, at least on a per capita basis, among the most vociferous greenhouse skeptics, i.e., those who challenge the reality or interpretation of global warming. Many of the particip participants in this debate have ceased to act as scientists that is defined above, but rather act as if they were lawyers hired to defend a particular perspective. New evidence has no effect on their preordained conclusions. This, abhorrent, uh, this is abhorrent to science and spoils the fun of it. Now, we didn't, we're not talking about the, the underlying facts of, of, of uh, uh, global warming or, or climate change here. We're talking about the process by which the administration has operated and the environment in which it's made decisions about how to get a message out. And uh, with all the, the claims of big oil and drilling and ANWR and all the other uh, things that will actually make America a much better place, uh, with cheaper energy for especially the poor, I, I fail to see where we've, we've made any progress. What we've really done is tied ourselves up with the beliefs of an individual who's been very critical of the administration. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Or you just want to, you can let my statement stand if you want. I'd just like to remark, uh, I'd like to remark, an important facet of all of this is we need to continue to encourage a wide diversity of viewpoints. The science extra enterprise is to constantly test the received wisdom, and that goes back and forth. Now, there's a lot of strong agreement on, this, on climate change, on the fact it's occurring and that humans are part of it. But there's still many, many lines of inquiry that the scientists are in fact pursuing and they're testing each other on. 
Uh, the same is true, by the way, in the policy perspective. We take, we, take, uh, we take the advice of economists, we take the advice of lawyers, we take the advice of policy people, we take the advice of politicians and communications people. Um, this is an extremely complicated issue. It's not the province of any particular professional class. Uh, I actually am pleased that at the direction of the National Academy, they pushed us to create a more integrated process for, for linking science with the technology development process. That had not happened before. We're doing that now. Those two processes are then working their way much better, really with the urging of Congress as well, into the policy development exercise. It requires a lot of people providing lots of viewpoints. And then we, we work to sort it out. That's what our role is, your role and the senior administration officials' roles. I would just point out that the, uh, the, probably the most, uh, the hardest figure in the history of America on environmental issues was the Moses of the West, Brigham Young, who took Mormons to, uh, to Utah, which I represent. And he was uh, very concerned about, about the environment. Um, and by the way, slightly in a religious context, but it seems to me that dogma ought to be left to the area of religion. And that what we, what we ought to do is look at the science and try and figure out where we're going because the decisions are huge. These, the, the implications uh, of, of uh, eliminating CO2, I, I think uh, Mr. Issa said earlier that it'd be uh, 35 trillion, oh, $350 trillion, roughly uh, more than about 10 times as much as the total net worth of, of all uh, of America. This is, these numbers are astounding. And so the question is, what do we do as, as humans to adapt, to, to deal in that situation? And you've been leading the fight on this. You've been dealing with this. You've been in the, in the vortex. Uh, do you have other things you want to say and comment well, about that? Well, you know, I, I think we're going back five years' history looking at individual edits to individual documents that never made it into most of the reports, at least the ones of concern. So uh, I much preferred the hearing we had last summer, which was actually trying to dig into the detailed solutions uh, to tackling this problem, on which, by the way, there's strong bipartisan support, uh, whether it's the advancement of you know, way out there technologies like fusion, uh, near term technologies like hydrogen, uh, the Energy Policy Act passed bipartisan in both houses of Congress, uh, going after uh, renewable fuels, going after vehicle fuel, uh, actually the energy bill didn't include vehicle fuel efficiency, but we'd like the Congress to consider that, um, and as well as a w billions of dollars in tax incentives to advance a new generation of, of coal that could ultimately be zero emission. These are the solutions, this is what we should be working on. You know, I, I call this, what is it about yes you don't understand? We have this strong commitment to get on with the solutions, let's, let's do that. It, it, yeah, it sounds to me, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, my time, yeah, uh, but thank you, I, I yield back. Okay, thank you. The um, chair yields himself uh, time to pursue a second round. I, Mr. Chairman, oh, Mr. I haven't Shays. had a first round yet. Oh, Mr. Shays. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> I, I, when Kyoto was negotiated, uh, Cong the Senate voted a hundred to one, and if there was someone absent, it was unanimous. Don't come back if you leave out India and China. So the Clinton administration comes back having left out India and China. Whereupon there were only about three to five members of the Senate who said they supported the treaty. Uh, but given that the president said he was against it, and uh, people have, are finally facing up to the reality of global warming, even though Kyoto left out two of the potentially biggest contributors, uh, every senator acts like they would have voted for it. I wish to God that this administration had submitted to the, to the Senate the Kyoto Treaty without prejudice. There would have been five members who would have actually voted for it. It's not unlike the two-thirds of the Congress and the three-quarters of the Senate. Some members now acted like they never voted for the war in Iraq. So. Um, but the sad thing is, Mr. Conantin, and we have talked about it more than once, because this administration wanted to appeal to a narrow base that didn't believe in global warming and so therefore was silent about the need to deal with it early on, uh, you're having to deal with what you're having to deal with. And that is the tragedy of this, in my judgment. You have done some amazing bilateral agreements to reduce the impact of global warming. You will get no credit for it. Uh, because this administration early on wanted to give the impression that they didn't believe in global warming. That's the way I look at it. And I'm sorry that, uh, and then we hire someone who is very capable, did a nice job in his performance before us, but represented before um, the petroleum industry. 
uh, which is not kind of what you would expect in the position that he was holding. Wouldn't you agree that you know some of what you're having to deal with is just a bad start? Sure. I mean, I, I think uh, you know it's also though the challenge of leadership. Uh, the prior administration did not make explicit the fact that the treaty was not going to work. President Bush did, uh, as indicated in my written testimony, uh, that did earn the uh, undeservedly earn all the uh, ill will that is that is that has been directed at the president uh, and our strategy since then. Um, that and it's ironic because actually where I would depart from you when you you align the president with some of the constituencies, it was the president in June of 2001, following the National Academy of Sciences report, said, "This is what we know. The academy's told us about some key uncertainties, but notwithstanding that, we need to take action now to begin to address this important problem." And he set in place a process that then I inherited when I came in in June of 2001. After that of running the policy that led to the 2002 climate policy um, strategic plan. So, you know, it's all the more ironic because the president himself actually, as he should have, took the advice of the academy and led probably the single most aggressive well, effort at the cabinet level. Let me some other ironies. Yeah. Um, Al Gore is right about global warming. It is a very real inconvenient truth and it needs to be dealt with. I'd love to compare his house with President Bush's house. I'd love to compare it. So you have one who advocates dealing with global warming but doesn't practice it, and you have another president who has been, frankly, quiet about global warming, in my judgment, and practices dealing with it in his own personal life. That is one of the, the other huge ironies. In There's this. a wonderful USA Today story about the president's uh, house down in Texas. It is a model of, of green building and, and environmental conservation. Or when we hear the actors and actresses who complain about Humvees driving up in long stretch limousines, flying in airplanes that make Humvees look like um, they get tremendous mileage. The irony in this debate, I hope once we get beyond all this, we'll start to deal with the reality of what we need to deal with. And uh, I just say to you, I, I think it hasn't happened because of how we stepped into this debate. And I'm afraid, frankly, there are some on the religious right, uh, whatever party, that have denied global warming. And when it finally happens, they're going to say, well, this is the fulfillment of the Bible and the destruction of humanity. I mean, I, I, it's just like, I hope we wake up. And I hope we wake up soon. And I encourage you to keep doing the good work you're doing. Uh, but I just wish you were more vocal about the good work you're doing. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned everything except nuclear. Uh, wouldn't you say it was notable that uh, Dr. Hansen was very supportive of nuclear uh, in every round of questioning? Uh, and yet, to be honest, uh, Al Gore and his movie and, and all of the activities is a pushback from nuclear con pretty consistently. Have you, have you seen that, that interesting dichotomy that those who want us to, uh, uh, to deal with global warming are have a tendency to be extremely anti-nuclear, even though it's a zero emissions. Uh, there's no question that if you are serious about climate change, you have to be serious about nuclear, at least for the next many decades. It's the only base load zero emission source we've got. It has the smallest environmental footprint of any source we've got. Uh, and we know how to do it right. We've been doing it right in America for a long time, and the modern plants are even better than the older ones. Uh, so uh, I use that as a, as a gauge, actually, when I deal with people on climate change. If, if they're not open to a serious discussion of nuclear, I tend to find that their interest in the issue is more rhetorical than real. Gentlemen's time has expired. And now the chair will yet recognize himself uh, for a second round. When uh, this administration came in, they rejected Kyoto. Maybe it couldn't have passed. The Senate probably couldn't have. But I didn't hear the administration go back and ask the countries that met in Kyoto to reconvene and see if they could renegotiate a treaty. Fact number one. Secondly, you pointed out with pride all of the things that this administration has done and is doing, but all the scientists tell us that the emissions of carbon are going up and not down, which means the planet is going to get in a more difficult situation in the direction we're moving. Now, um, what appears to some of us is that it looks like the administration's policy was pretty much the petroleum industry's policy, which is 
let's sort of let's uh, try to confuse things and suggest that there's not such a big problem of global warming. We'll try to sow some doubt about it. That's what it appears to many of us. Now, I want to find out whether this was a deliberate White House strategy to sow doubt or, 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 or if, if, if I'm incorrect about it. Did you ever have any communications with anyone in the White House outside of CEQ about the value of emphasizing uncertainty in climate change? I had conversations with people outside of CEQ about the broad range of science, which included uh, uncertainties related to issues such as aerosols, uh, some of the other factors that were in the National Academy of Sciences report. And who so were the answer, those? The answer, the answer to that is, is yes, with scientists as well as non-scientists. Who were those people in the uh, White House outside of CEQ? Uh, especially the, the, the budgeteers that we were working on, the 10-year strategic plan, because a lot the of budgeteers the- Budgeteers were OMB? Yeah, because exclusively and as, as well OMB as, people, as well as the Office of Science and Technology Policy, including Jack Marburger, uh, because this 10-year strategic plan, uh, Mr. Chairman, was all about how we're going to direct our resources toward these key areas of uncertainty that the National Academy of Sciences has identified. So we had a we had an extensive set of conversations all the way up to the cabinet level on how to get this 10-year uh, research plan going. Which, now, by the way, again, I would underline the National Academy of Sciences hailed this plan as having ambition and vision. Yes. So, so Mr. Connett, uh, uh, I have only a limited period of time, so sure. I want to ask you some very specific questions. When the White House uh, appeared to edit the climate change science reports, that was highly controversial. And several of the changes made front page headlines. Did you have communications with others in the White House outside of CEQ about the reaction to CEQ's edits and how to manage that reaction? Uh, first of all, the controversy was, was created by media stories, which I think grossly uh, distorted the actual record of our process and the final documents, to which scientists, no scientists no, no, did raised you, objection. You're not answering my question. I just want to, you gave no, a context no, I that asked I, you I, gave, I asked you a specific question. I really want an answer. Well, Mr. And it Chairman, be you gave a context that simply. I can't agree with. And I need to start with disagreeing with did your Did you have any conversations with anybody about how to handle the public relations once these reports were certainly did. Out. I talked with the White House communicators because this had achieved national and actually international Could you tell us stature. who the communicators were? Uh, at the time, I would, I would have to get back to you on that because I, okay. I don't know exactly when people moved in and out. Did you have any communications with White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card? About? About the global warming reports. Uh, I only had a conversation with him uh, after the reports came out. Did you have any conversations with him as you took your job as to how you were going to handle your job? Uh, yes, I did. And when was that? Uh, that would have been in the middle of June. June what year? 2001. Okay. That's and when I was assigned the portfolio on climate change, on air pollution, and a whole range of issues, a fuel economy, and a whole range of issues on the energy, national energy plan. And, and, what, and did, he, uh, did he suggest to you some policies you might pursue? Or what, what, tell us about the, the conversation. Uh, as it was, relates to global warming climate change. Mr. Card was happy to have me on board. He, has, he said there were very specific areas that we should get into. Uh, we wanted to really focus on, this, on the technology. Uh, we had been given, uh, we had been given uh, this strong advice from the National Academy of Sciences, and we want to make sure also we're advancing the science in the way the President directed. So now really what Mr. Card was doing was reinforcing for me the agenda that the President had already clearly laid out in now his after, policy address. Now, after uh, the reports were put out, you said you had some co communications with him? Yes, that, he wanted to know, be because what we had regarded... Could you tell us when that was, approximately? I can't, I can't recall the specific date. Okay, and what was, he, tell us about that communication. The report, we had scientific sign-off on the report, so when it came out, and the media began to nitpick, I guess, some leaked, I guess the report had been out for some time. And then some, someone in the media be, got a hold of leaked versions of some of these early edits, without even, by the way, comparing to see if they'd made it into the final document. Um, that's what created the media flap. And so there Did were he, questions, what was the report? What he, was it about? We actually treated you? this as a routine, as a routine publication. This it was, was only later sensationalized. With this was a direct conversation with Andrew Card. Uh, I had one direct conversation with him. On this issue? Yep. The reaction to the report? Right. This is much later after it came out and the leaked edits, uh, the leaked edits emerged. And uh, you don't recall the date of that? No, I don't. Okay. Did he, um, um, 
Okay. Um, did he suggest you do something other than what you were doing? Uh, no, we were actually. Uh, or was he just ans asking questions about what you did? He wanted to know what the report, what the process was. Was the process followed? Uh, I assured him that it had been followed. I assured him that, uh, in fact, the scientists at the end of the process had ultimately reconciled all comments. Uh, and he was uh, actually, uh, well, I don't want to speak for him. Okay, but. now uh, we know that some of the documents we've seen came from the vice, they had uh, related to uh, communications with the vice president's office. Did you talk to anybody in the vice, the vice president's office, including the vice president or any of his staff, such as Kevin O'Donovan or anyone else in that office? About? About global warming, climate change, the report? Sure. And I talked to all the offices of the White House about climate change. It's an issue that's been with us for six years. I can't think of a single office, including public, uh, the Office of Public Liaison, in which there hasn't been some interface of one kind or another about climate change, uh, but really focused on the technology initiatives of the President, uh, much less so on the science. So uh, you had frequent communications with, um, was it Kevin O'Donovan or others in uh, the Vice We have a office? very vigorous uh, interagency process that includes participation by the various White House offices as they see fit, as well as all the various agencies. So you can lump in a dozen agencies, you know, and six or seven White House offices. Thank you. Well, we'll look forward to learning more about those. Uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, where are your offices? Uh, on Jackson Place, right in front of the White House, right on Lafayette Square. Right, which is really part of now the White House complex That's area. Correct. And when did, uh, when did essentially the oversight of global climate change, when did it move to the White House area? In other words, how long have the offices that are overseeing this part of science, how long have they been within, you know, what we always think of as the White House, Treasury, uh, old executive office, the various townhouses, and of course the White House itself? Uh, my office, the Council on Environmental Quality, was created in 1969. So it's been there for more than 30, for almost 30, 40 years. Uh, the uh, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, I believe, was created a few years later than that. And those are the two primary sort of policy offices as it relates to energy and, I mean, environment and natural resources and some of those matters. Uh, and then, um, and then there's the Domestic Policy Council, of course. The National Economic Council was created under the Clinton administration. Uh, and then during the Clinton administration, they actually had a sub-office specifically okay. focused on climate change, where they coordinated all of the climate change efforts um, uh, across the Clinton administration. We decided to consolidate that within CEQ. We didn't Which is also in that White House complex. Correct. So it's fair to say that, that administration after administration, this has been something which has, it's, although it's evolved and it's grown, every administration has thought it important enough to take up this very small amount of space available in and around the White House, rather than sending it off to uh, Crystal City or, or any number of other large federal buildings uh, a few miles away that certainly other things have been pushed out of. Well, yeah, there's a bit of a catch-22 to the discussion we're having today. This issue is very important. It's presidentially level important. Uh, but that said, we also made clear to do some assignments. So, the, so at NOAA, the head of the climate science program, right. that was housed at NOAA. And so all of our feet, our input went to them, and sure. they had the final call on science but documents. I just want to make, you know, just understand that this is something where you get to say you're coming from the White House, because effectively these buildings are everyone, everyone except people maybe inside the Beltway, we don't, we, we know the difference between the old executive office and whether or not you've got something in the Roosevelt Room wing or whatever, but the bottom line is, you're right there in the White House complex, and this administration has kept it that important. Let me just follow up on a couple of things. When this administration, and I realize you weren't with it in the first days, but you were pretty close, uh, this administration inherited Kyoto. It was dead on arrival at the Senate. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. It was dead three years before that. Right. Uh, so it just hadn't been buried. But well, we actually, also it had effectively because the prior administration never sent the treaty, treaty to the Senate. So we also, uh, thank you, and we also, this administration also inherited a methyl bromide, uh, the Montreal Protocol, which exempted all of the third world. Is that right? Uh, it actually put them on a, a delayed compliance schedule, right. which they're now beginning to implement. Right. It, it, this is the year in which they're going to have to actually have to 
cut down their use. But basically, they've been unrestricted. And correct me if I'm wrong, methyl bromide basically moved from the United States and Europe to Africa and developing countries in South America who were unrestricted. The flower industry of Holland mostly moved, moved to other countries. So this is something that was done in previous administrations. It sounded good, but the bottom line is it didn't change the emissions of this terrible ozone-depleting material one bit, did it? Um, I Outside the U.S. Yeah, I, I believe that is. Um, I believe that is true. Uh, the issue you always face in these international agreements with global um, emissions uh, is what's called leakage. If you if you squeeze the balloon too tight in one place, and the other the other you know the other country is not constrained, you actually get an increase in those emissions. That's a fundamental issue in the climate policy sure. debate. So some of this was what one might call unilateral disarmament on emissions. We, we stopped, but it didn't change one bit the amount of emissions. Now, yes, the, and in Congressman, there's a place for leadership, which the U.S. is demonstrating, but you don't want your leadership to sacrifice your economic objectives to greater emissions someplace else. Now, the United States is leading the world. This Congress has funded leading the world in, uh, in cleaning up coal and other carbon emitters, recognizing that without sequestration, you're not getting there, uh, that, that that has to be part of it. But isn't it true that China builds basically one coal-fired plant every week, week in and week out, uh, for, for the last couple of years, and plans to continue doing so, and that those tend to be among the dirtiest uh, electric production facilities in the world? Yes, they will build, I'm told, 140 in the next three years, and they are massively industrializing and picking up a lot of the manufacturing and industrial output that might otherwise be occurring in places like the United States or Europe for a variety of reasons. Okay. Then I will, as I yield back, uh, simply make the point that this administration has a bigger problem than just good research. We have to get it applied around the world or it won't make a bit of difference in global warming. Well, Mr. Issa, to the point that was raised by the chairman, which I would sharply disagree, we did reconvene internationally. We just didn't reconvene in Kyoto. Uh, we have dozens of bilateral partnerships now and we have many, many multinational agreements on advancing hydrogen, on advancing renewable fuels, uh, on advancing um, uh, methane capture, as I indicated, I mean, the list is quite lengthy of real international agreement, the most recent of which was the Asia-Pacific Partnership on Clean Development Cl Climate, which includes India and China and South Korea, who comes in third in terms of new emissions, for the first time. So we found a different way to have the international conversation, and this is a foundation on, that we can build on. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, California is going to be a huge beneficiary of that because we are all about opening up markets for good old-fashioned green technologies from California and really getting them into these, into these marketplaces in Asia. That's where the solution lies. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Connaughton, I want to uh, ask Connaughton, you. Connaughton, please. Thank you. I'm sorry. Connaughton. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Thanks. Connaughton. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to ask you about your decision to hire Phil Cooney as your chief of staff. Uh, as you know, Mr. Cooney was a very successful oil industry lobbyist. He had worked for the Petroleum Institute in his job there, among other things, was to stop or delay governmental actions on climate change. Uh, they weren't shy about their point of view on that. Uh, but that obviously is an agenda inconsistent with uh, the mission of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, my question is this, who made the decision to hire Mr. Cooney? I did. And I assume you were aware of the work he did at the American Petroleum Institute. Yes, I was. Uh, did you have any concerns about that work and how it would uh, affect uh, the work that he was to do uh, at the environmental agency, or was that a reason why he was hired? Uh, in my many years in Washington, I've come across a lot of people in the professional world, lawyers, uh, people from the environmental community and other places. Uh, of the many people I intersected with uh, in, in my professional life, Mr. Cooney was one of the people of highest integrity that I've run across. He's also an outstanding manager, and actually I saw it as a great benefit that he had experienced in the energy sector because one of the major tasks I knew I was going to be taking on was the CEQ portion of, of implementing the national energy policy. So it was actually something Mr. Cooney knew something about. Uh, but the first, uh, and actually it was an honor for me to have him join me. Uh, and I have to say, you know, uh, as much as the tone of this hearing has been what it is, um, uh, Mr. Cooney is, is a best-in-class individual when it comes to integrity, 
uh, honesty, uh, and ethics. Uh, and I, I do greatly regret uh, some of the insinuations that I've heard from, this, from some members of this committee uh, about the fact that Mr. Cooney might have been unable to divorce himself from one client uh, and take on the role of public servant. I certainly did. Mr. Welch, I would submit you certainly did at some point in your life when you became elected. Uh, we are all capable of serving the institutions in which, we, in which we're employed. There, I, don't, I haven't heard anybody raise questions about Mr. Cooney or anyone else's integrity. <clears throat> what I understood and I've heard is a fair amount of evidence uh, that the American Petroleum Institute had a clear point of view on climate change uh, and a fair amount of evidence that many of those views on climate change for one reason or another, uh, conviction or politics, I'm not going to make a, a conclusion, found their way uh, into uh, into reports through editing, 181 different edits. Uh, did you have any concern uh, about what signal would be sent? As we leave this hearing for live coverage of the House today, this quick note to pass on to you. This Wednesday, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Energy and Air Quality will hold a joint hearing with the House Science and Technology Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment discussing climate change. Vice, uh, former Vice President Al Gore is among those scheduled to testify. We'll have live coverage Wednesday starting at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. That will be on C-SPAN 3. Now to live coverage of the U.S. House as members uh, deal with bills on natural resources. Now to the floor. Goodwill.